folks, welcome to Board Game Breakfast, episode 51. This week is the week of BGG.com, which is a board game convention that's based on a website, BoardGameGeek.com. And this is a convention that's uh, somewhere between two and 3,000 people, and it is all about board games. There's pretty much nothing else going on. And me and several of the other contributors from the Dice Tower will be there. Dan King, the Board Game Geek, will be there. In fact, he wanted me to let you know that at the flea market, he will be getting rid of tons of his uh, review copies that he has for very low prices. Um, Eric Summer will be there and many of the different contributors. And you can see many of these folks on Friday night uh, I'm from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, we do the Dice Tower 2-Minute Show, which is everybody comes on and they have two minutes exactly, and then they're off. We have a guest, um, maybe one or two guest co-hosts on the show. You'll have to wait and see how that works out. Um, but that's, we'll be putting it up on video and uh, audio when we get back. Also, on Friday night, if you're at Board Game Geek Con, at 11 p.m., go to the main area and watch the Battle Tops Tournament. I cannot tell you everything that will happen there, but I can tell you it will be amazing. And if you want me to record you saying shut the door, come on by, find me, I'll record you and we'll put that on our show somewhere. Um, I'll also bring promos for anybody who's interested in them. Sheriff of Nottingham promos, poker chips, whatever. You know, if you want me to bring something, I'll bring them along with me. And then there's also a special Sheriff of Nottingham event that Kevin uh, Burkhard Meyer is going to be running. Uh, where he's dressing up like the sheriff is to be entertaining. And I mention that because finally, Sheriff of Nottingham is now available. So if you want to buy the game, you can. <laughs> I'm really glad. Uh, it's going into its third print run already. So I'm glad to see that the game is doing well. It's a very fun game. So check that out. And the biggest news of all, uh, Jack Vass Memorial Fund closed, making over $70,000. Thank you very much. Uh, for everyone who donated, uh, via, whether via money or via putting items up or whether you just spread the word or not, that's a big deal and will be a help, I hope, to many different people. All right, let's get to the board game news. Hey, lots of interesting news this week. Fantasy Flight has announced the first wave for Star Wars Armada. That's going to have many different ships in it. And, I mean, I, I like X-Wing a lot, but there is something about moving these big ships around. Like the, the Victory Class Star Destroyer, the Carillion Corvette, the Nebula B, uh, packs of lots of different little fighters. You know, as, as You're basically controlling huge armadas rather than some small um, fighting squads. Uh, Star War, uh, some, I'm sorry, Summoner Wars Alliance is coming out. I look forward to that. One of my most anticipated games in a long time. But they're going to have dividers for all the expansions so far and mats, as you can see in this picture here. AEG announced their latest expansion for Smash Up. Pretty, pretty Smash Up. All right. I have been waiting to talk about this for a long time. Now there will be ponies, and there will be fairies, and princesses, and cute kittens, and you can mix those so you can have zombie kittens, and ghost princesses, and robot ponies, and uh, metamorpho metamorph uh, fairies, or whatever. Uh, and my daughters are excited about it. Mom excited about it. I think it will be hilarious to see all of this in play. Hasbro bought DreamWorks. Does that have anything to do with board games? Will we see board games based on the DreamWorks things? Pretty bad board games or maybe some good ones and vice versa? Will we see movies made by DreamWorks about board games? This probably isn't anything interesting, but you never know. Talisman, a new expansion for that coming out from Fantasy Flight called Deep Realms. Uh, Ignacy from Portal has announced a new expansion for Imperial Sellers, which will be available at Board Game Geek Con this week. Why can't we be friends? <laughs> okay, um, Tabletop started this past week. Their first episode was uh, Tokaido, which I thought wouldn't make a very interesting game to watch being played, and it wasn't really that interesting, but it was, there was some moments, so check that out. And then Legendary Villains as an expansion, which again can be used as an expansion for Legendary Villains or Legendary, and this is Fear Itself, which was a comic arc in Marvel, which came out a few years ago, in which some serpent arch enemy of Odin came and transformed some heroes and things into powerful villains, and they all fought against each other. So that would be interesting, just more stuff for Legendary is always good. A couple more shelves to show you what I have in my collection and why I'm keeping it there. 
Uh, two brand new games, Alchemist, which I really enjoy. This will be in my collection for a while. My daughter also likes it a lot. And Argent, which is a game that I said in my review that I wasn't sure a lot of people like, but I like it, which is why I made the collection. Carson City, a worker placement game about the Wild West where you can attack other players a little bit in it. There's some dueling face-off. It really brings a good Western theme to it. It doesn't get talked about as much today, but I think it's a solid game. And then Yomi, a two-player fighting game. This is Street Fighter in a Box. Uh, lots of fun, uh, very fast. Think of rock, paper, scissors multiplied quite a bit. Freedom the Underground Railroad, which is a phenomenally good cooperative game about the freeing of the slaves. Uh, during the Civil War. Lifeboats, which is one of the most evil games in existence as you vote people and throw them overboard. I keep this one. Some people say, why don't you like Diplomacy, Tom? I have it. It's here in a box and it's much faster. Kemet and Cyclades, uh, keep these, you know, next to each other because there's an expansion that puts them together. I tried to put them in both boxes, but then Cyclades Titans came out, so now Cyclades has been moved to this box. So, uh, and then Kemet has an expansion coming out soon too, so there you go. Ursoup, which is now called Primordial Soup, and Aladdin's Dragons. Now, these are two older games. I'm glad, you know, I don't like just new stuff. Ursoup is a hilarious game about um, creating amoebas, and you get to, like, customize them and give them genes, make, make them different, and then you go around and attack other amoebas, or you go around and eat food, which happens to be the leftover excrement of the other amoebas. Yes, you get to eat poop in this game, ha ha ha. Aladdin's Dragons is a blind bidding game. It's actually one of the key series from Richard Brees, but the, uh, Hans and Gluck and uh, Rio Grande redid it, and it really is a beautiful little game. Very cool games here on these shelves. Dragons will bite you, your friends there and bite you In your house take off your shoes When you play, play the Game of Thrones Lannister family, fight you with lots of glee Whittle down your family tree with some half ancestrally Oh, in the Game of Thrones When you play, play the Game of Thrones It's a game, about a game Called the Game of Thrones Here's a book about a book called the Game of Thrones and it kills when you kill in the Game of Thrones. Don't get bored on this board called the Game of Thrones. Got your troops of on Twins Ridge, lots of drinks in the fridge. Wish the book it was a bridge instead of a bunch of Peter Nicolage. And you know Game of Thrones. A game full of intrigue. Lots of diplomacy, making our Sarah see lots of boobs on your TV. In a Game of Thrones, I say, whoa, whoa, when you play the Game of Thrones. Well, it's a game, a bad game, gone the Game of Thrones. Here's a book, a bad book, gone the Game of Thrones. And it kills, when you kill, in the Game of Thrones. One thing that board games do better than any other form of entertainment is let players negotiate with their opponents. Even games that don't have trading built into the mechanics lend themselves to the idea of deals. I think everybody just instinctively knows the phrase, if you don't attack me this turn, I won't attack you next turn. Why does trading and negotiation work its way into so many games either by design or just organic development of playing the game? I think it's because people like the sensation of getting something for nothing. And it's a real world skill that has application in the game and out of the game. Just one of the many things that games can teach us. Now there are lots of games that incorporate negotiation into the way they work. Whether they're applied to a real world theme such as the stock market or commodities trading, or whether they're more fictional like Settler's Pioneer theme or City of Horror's Zombie Apocalypse. No matter what, negotiation is key to success in all those games. And now I'm going to show you some. After being out of print for quite some time, Sid Saxon's I'm the Boss is finally back on the market to the sound of much rejoicing from gamers everywhere. Three to six players are power brokers in the world of high finance, trying to make as much money for their clients as they possibly can. 
After a certain number of deals are inked, the person with the most money is the winner. Now, when you're the active player, you're the boss. You set the terms of the deal within the basic parameters that the game presents you. Add to this influence cards that let people muck around with the game, and what you have is a cutthroat, wheeling and dealing, negotiation masterpiece. Reiner Knizia's Quo Vadis uses the political shenanigans of ancient Rome as the backdrop for a great negotiation game where promises will be made, allegiances formed, and backs stabbed. Players control a cabal of senators, moving around, trying to gain influence, and trying to get the emperor's ear. The player with the most influence at the end of the game is going to be our winner, but only if at least one of their senators has made it into the final council chamber and has become one of Caesar's innermost trusted circle. That's all the time we have today for negotiation games, but join me next week, and if you make it worth my while, I'll show you some more. Question time with Tommy Vassell. And Jason Levine. You're supposed to say like J or something. It's kind of cool. Okay. <laughs> we have a question today. Someone asked us about the Marvel Dice Masters game, which is a game we both really enjoy. Yes. And the question is, why is it so unthematic? They're like, how could Black Widow possibly take out the Hulk? Why isn't the Hulk like 200 times stronger than, you know, the next highest level guy? How do Thulk, uh, Thulk, <laughs> Thor, Hulk, and Thing lose to like Hawkeye and Black Widow? That doesn't make any thematic sense. How is that possible? I don't know. That's just a weird question because no games make thematic sense really unless you're playing real life or playing exactly what happens in a comic book storyline. Nothing ever is truly thematic to um, its background. But in general, the powers that they gave to each of the characters feels like those characters. So like Hawkeye has a first strike which is like him pulling the, the bow. So I think that the powers that they gave are actually thematic to the characters. I agree com completely with Jason in that sense. There's a thematic flavoring. You cannot have them act like their characters because, yes, Black Widow could probably not beat Hulk, right? But if you ever read a great comic, which is Deadpool versus Hulk, Deadpool can't beat Hulk either. Yeah. But what he kept doing is he ran around a factory and Hulk was trying to... And finally he buried the Hulk and a whole pile of stuff and then escaped. Yeah. Okay? So... All that has to be condensed down into dice rolling. Not to mention, in comic books, anyone can beat anybody at any given time. So, but I mean, I think you have to pull in that theming yourself to some degree. You know, when Hawkeye beats uh, Hulk, it's not that he beat him, but that he basically completed the mission or tied Hulk up for a brief moment. Before Hulk could get free, Hawkeye was gone. Yeah, I mean, I don't... I never equated it to. I just love. <laughs> I, I, I never equated that. Well, how come this character could beat this? Because any character could beat any character. Um, but more so, I look at what each character does and how each character really fits the theme of what their character is like in the comic book, which to me is what really makes it cool. As opposed to Quarriors, where they were just random people, this is, you know, or random wizards or whatever. This is like. Spider-Man feels like a Spider-Man, he does Spider-Man kind of things, and Thor does Thor kind of things with his hammer, and Hulk is really strong like Hulk, and Wolverine can slice you with his adamantium claws, and it really gives you the feel, each character's power gives you the feel of that character so well. All right. Well, that's it for this time. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jay Levine. Perusing Kickstarter a few weeks ago, I came across Terrain Tech, which was like light up terrain, and I was interested in it, so I shot an email off to them and asked them, you know, if they could tell me a little bit more about it. And lo and behold, they actually live in the Keys of Florida, which is really close to me, so they drove up here and showed me what the terrain looks like. Now, what this is, it's, it's really, this is problematic, I think, because this is one of those things that if you were standing in the room when they showed it to me, it would have amazed you. I don't think it comes across as cool in the video, but what exactly are they showing off? Let me show you a bit of it. Sorry. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the pre-production version of the 2x2 mat. And as you can see, it's very simple. It's really thin, so it just rolls out onto your table like that. And then in order to make it work, you just start laying your pieces on it. So you can see you can move them anywhere that you want on the power grid is what we're calling it. And it uh, just makes it super easy to use your, your components. So it's a couple of well, What's making those pieces glow? 
Uh, there's a little wireless coil that we have inside of it, and we embed an LED in there. And the nice thing it's is, like it, this, then. yeah, so you can you can change the different colors. So, for instance, if you wanted to have a a, a crystal, let's see if this is a different color. Yeah, so say you wanted to go with lava, you could change your look. And uh, these these are pre-production, of course, but they'll they'll fit into the bottom of them, so the players can change them out. So, how long do these batteries last? Okay, well, yeah, the most important thing is that there are no batteries involved. So just to give an example, you can see when we lift this up in the air that there's a magnetic field. It's all wireless. So once you set it down on your mat, then you never have to worry about using batteries again. So there's a couple of uh, different components here that everybody's familiar with from Star Wars, Fantasy Flight games. And then we've got, you know, if you wanted to have a, like asteroids, 3D asteroids, you got uh, Star Wars, you got Hero Clicks here, um, different bases that we've created for your regular miniatures. Now is the uh, the board itself, is there, I mean, is it dangerous for me to put my hand here? No, no, it, it won't hurt you. This is uh, a science that's been around for years. Uh, matter of fact, they're charging phones with another version of it. It's not the exact same as this, but uh, this is our proprietary version of it, but as safe as charging your phone on a wireless pad. So if I put like a piece of train here and I can put this guy on top and it still glows. Yep. yep. It goes through almost anything. Yeah, it's almost invisible to the magnetic field, sure. So th this this may actually be the first flight of a 28 millimeter dwarf that's ever taken place. But as you can see, this again, this is a pre-production version, but just to show you how tiny the circuit board is, and we'll actually be able to embed this into a tile so that you'll, you won't even see any of that. But what we've done, we've taken this wireless component and you can see the propeller stop and then when we set it back down. So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually get it to fly? So by putting an amplifier on it, we we're actually able to do that. So again, we can embed this into uh, different size tiles. So if we did like a six by six tile or something like that, you could actually have that as a power station. Now, of course, I'm interested to see how this works in the board gaming realm. And so the first game that came to my mind was Power Grid. And so the fact that you could play a game of Power Grid and then stick a piece of your color, maybe put a little house on top of that to um, show. So different people could have different lights on the board and you could be playing Power Grid on top of this and actually having the lights light up. And it's not showing up on, as well on camera here because um, there's lighting on the table. But here, let me turn off the light for a second and you can see how... Now you wouldn't play Power Grid in the dark, but it looks pretty good in Half-Light, which is enough to play the game. And so this is a, a thing, and I'm, I'm interested, you know, what other board games could this be used in? To me, I, I, this was just really neat to see. Now, it certainly is something that's expensive. I'm hoping the Kickstarter succeeds. I don't know if it will or not. But this is something I told them they have to like bring to conventions and show people because when you see it and the possibilities behind it, like you can have miniatures on this with moving parts like propellers on an airplane as you move uh, across the board. If you can get lasers involved in this where they can show the firing arc of, let's say, an X-Wing or one of the Star Trek ships on the board, Wow, that's just phenomenal. And other board games that it might be used for. Um, I mean, obviously, Power Grid was one that just popped right into my mind, and I would love to see that. But different board games with different light-up spots. Maybe um, Sam Healy mentioned uh, Arkham Horror, where they have the gates, or, or Elder Char, where uh, gates would be lit up on the board so you knew where they are. And that, that, that big black mat, it's, like, it's going to look nice. Remember, everything you saw here was very prototypish. But this is like new technology, like something that I think could be really cool. I don't have time to have big, humongous light displays, but if I have some, just this mat that I plug in and put these transmitters on, I was very impressed by this. This is something certainly to watch if you think it's interesting enough to kickstart it, go ahead. But um, keep an eye on this. I'm, I'm trying to get them to, to go to different conventions and show this off because I think this has some long-term repercussions that will be neat in the industry. So I have a link down underneath here if you want to look at their Kickstarter and see some more videos of this light up terrain. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. When I heard that Galaxy Trucker was coming to iOS, I was a bit skeptical because I thought the tile selection mechanism would be a little tough to implement digitally. Well, now the app is out, so let's take a quick look at how Check Games Edition did with the port. Spoiler alert, it's awesome. 
In one of Lada Javadil's best games, you build your ship out of space junk in the hopes of carrying cargo successfully through meteor showers, pirate attacks, and other challenges. In my gaming circles, it's a real love it or hate it game, with a lot of people reacting strongly to the real time competitive shipbuilding element. Galaxy Trucker is an app that pretty much has every feature you could ask for in a tier one app. There's a myriad of multiplayer options, including pass and play and online real time or asynchronous play. The frantic shipbuilding phase of Galaxy Trucker seemed to me impossible to implement digitally, but the game does a great job of mimicking the real life experience. The use of action points that enables async play is quite clever, but the app doesn't stop there. There is also a full solo play campaign mode that has some tough challenges and a delightfully engaging script, making it feel like an adventure game. The rules are implemented exceptionally well, and the tutorial walks you through everything. But if you're new to Galaxy Trucker, it'll still probably take you a few plays to figure out the basics of this unique game. But stick with it because the experience is worth the effort. The app is full of aesthetic details that bring the game to life, and one thing that really shines through is the humor at the heart of the game that I think is often missed in real life plays. This app is just fun to play. Galaxy Trucker's thoughtfulness, polish, and attention to detail places it as a front runner for Board Game App of the Year. Give it a try. <laughs> You say, Vessel, it's not Christmas time yet. Thanksgiving is next week. Yes, you're right. But it is time to shop for Christmas. You should not delay and wait till the last minute. This week, we're going to be posting five different videos that me, Sam Haley, and Zeke Gardasia did. We're calling them the 12 Games of Christmas. In each video, we each give four games, so that's 12 games total, uh, in five different categories. In thematic games, strategic games, family games, party games, and stocking stuffers. And so hopefully that will give you guys some good idea. We tried to pick games that are either in stock or about to be in stock. So hopefully that will give you, maybe you can send these videos to somebody and um, say, hey, uh, get us a couple of these games. Not to mention, I worked hard last week, so we have plenty of reviews that are going up this week also. And you'll see some from me and Dan and the Hamtag guys are talking about their top 10 Euro games. And so it's, it's a, a counterpunch to us talking about our war games. So anyhow, uh, let's see. Um, that's pretty much it. There's, of course, a Dice Tower is going up tomorrow and all our other podcasts on DiceTowerNetwork.com. But hey, it's time to move on. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, and I've recently harnessed the awesome power of wormholes to store my board game collection in. Unlike me, you probably don't have an infinite amount of interdimensional space in which to store your board games. This lack of wormhole access for the common man leads me to confusion when I look at how some board games are packaged. Take Splendor, for example. Inside this game's box, there's enough unused space to fit an entire another game. Or several. And Splendor is not the only game guilty of this waste of space. As a result, sooner or later, the game shelf of those without their own personal wormhole starts to resemble a head in the clouds segment. Oh, at first look, it seems to have substance, but upon closer inspection, you find there's actually a lot of nothing there. And as you add more mostly empty boxes to your collection, it's inevitable that you'll prematurely outgrow your available storage space. <laughs> the logical choice, of course, would be to swap boxes. There's no reason at all why Splendor couldn't reside inside a, a generic deck box, now taking up just a fraction of the space. Problem solved! Or so it would seem. Because this is where logic yields to practicality. I've never seen any gamer who's done this with the games in their collection. And yes, part of it is presentation. While generic boxes may take up less space, aesthetically, it goes against the grain. Game collection simply looks better in its original boxes. So I'm interested in finding out how you deal with the storage space overflow. Does anyone out there actually rebox? Do you rent storage space? Would you be interested in renting experimental wormhole-based storage space? Objects stored in wormhole may evaporate from reality. Let me know how you deal with storage space issues in the comments below. 
Hello, we're the Board Gamers. My name's Greg and this is Jim. How you doing? How's it going? And uh, we're, we're tashed up this week uh, for November. Um, yes. Uh, it might be a British thing. We're hoping it uh, travels to the States as well. Yes, it's not just a British fashion statement. It's in fact for raising money for a very good cause. So uh, yes. It did. And this week we're going to be looking at theme in game. How much uh, theme embedded into game. And we, we'd like to think we've got a, a nice range here for a you. A nice variety for you. Um, Starting probably at the top end, we have Firefly the game. Um, some people love it, some people don't. We know that Tom uh, is not uh, the biggest fan of it, and for thematic reasons, believe it or not. But I think personally, it's a fantastic uh, themed show. It shows uh, it's a lot of theme from the show, and it's shown exactly uh, what can be offered in a game. Um, at the uh, other end of the spectrum, unfortunately, yes. is The Walking Dead wow. uh, card what game. What does one say about this game? Uh, Cryptozoic has the IP for all the Walking Dead series and has done a dice game and a board game as well, which may be better, but the Walking Dead card game... Um, wow. Really, wow in be, all the wrong ways. <laughs> in all the wrong ways. <laughs> it could be stripped of theme. It could not exist. Um, you could put vegetables on there or wallpaper types or carpet samples and it would not change the game in any way whatsoever. Unfortunately, it's an example of a company taking an IP that they own and just slapping it. And just saying, we have to get every single yeah. game that we we'll can do in We'll just stick the Walking Dead on there and people will love it. They'll yeah. just buy it, they'll, they'll play it, um, who cares, it's Walking Dead, right? A terrible waste of, of an IP. Um, sort of asymmetrical abilities for the cards would have been great, but no, none of that. Slap bang in the middle, in my opinion, is the Sons of Anarchy. Um, it, it does use a little bit of the IP um, that it's got. Um, it can't be completely stripped from it, but at the same point, it's not um, It's not as in-depth as, say, Firefly and some other games like that. So Sons of Anarchy, worth uh, picking up if you're into the uh, into the uh, show as such. So we've so. got every end of the spectrum. Every end of the spectrum, and uh, that's us this the week. The good, the maybe not so bad, and, and the ugly. ugly. Anya Kylie, the nerdy girl here, with some gaming tips on how to deal with alpha gamers. Alpha gamers are a special type of gamer where most people tend to enjoy some of the social aspects and friendlier aspects of gaming, to the alpha gamer, this is secondary to the win and the integrity of the game. Now, these people often can make new gamers feel nervous, afraid, not even want to play. And this is a negative because it chases people away from the hobby and generally makes alpha gamers regarded as sometimes obnoxious at best. So. This is how you can channel that. First, alpha gamers are useful. Why? Because they tend to study the game and want to optimize the game. To a new player, they provide a wealth of knowledge that could potentially progress them through the game. The problem is when they start directing that person's choice. People are not puppets. And when people are playing a game and yet feel another person starts playing them, dictating all their moves, why would you want to do that? It's not satisfying. Although the win might be satisfying for the alpha gamer, both people aren't being satisfied. Instead, an alpha gamer could, similar to like a hence section of a video game or a strategy guide, give a newer gamer some advice, explain decisions, help them make the best choice as a team. Or perhaps, before playing the serious game, have a learning game where the alpha gamer helps explain some of the concepts and why certain decisions might be better than others. Lastly, an alpha gamer needs to never get upset at a new gamer. They need to understand that everyone has different levels of learning, different speeds, different types. And in fact, perhaps look at a new player as a challenge. So a win is really great if you can get it with a newbie on your squad. And don't use the term newbie. Anyway, what has worked for my gaming group, I hope it works for yours. Thanks for watching, and may RNG ever be in your favor. Thank you, guys. Okay, time for me to talk about something. Uh, usually, when I first started doing reviews, many people said, hey, Tom is the voice of positivity. And in fact, people say that even now. Like, does Tom ever dislike a game? Well, obviously, there are games I dislike. And I, if I dislike a game, I will come down pretty hard. And I hope that I articulate why I don't like the game for whatever reasons. The theming, the, the way the game plays, it just wasn't fun, it was boring, etc. But, inevitably, every time that I don't like a game, there's some kind of response to saying, 
you didn't play it right. I still remember years and years ago when I reviewed an abstract strategy game and I just hated it. It was just terrible. And the designer emailed me a very, very, very long email that basically said, you need to play this game 15 times before you can even begin to grasp the concepts of this. And then you will see how good it is. Well, I, I grant that as you play a game more, you will see things more in the game. But let's talk about this concept of playing the game right. I think we can all agree, if you don't, well, I guess we can't all agree, but I think most people would agree that it's possible to play a game incorrectly. Uh, maybe the game is a war game and you decide, let's say, we'll take Axis and Allies. Germany and Russia and Great, you know, are playing against a Great, uh, sorry, Germany and Japan are playing against Great Britain, Russia, and America. And Germany decides he's just going to hole up and not help at all. Well, that can really hurt the game, right? He's not playing the game right, or he just moves things around, messes things up. You can play a game and do some really weird moves that really benefit another player. You can make trades in Monopoly that really benefit someone else, and that can ruin the experience for someone else. You can play the game wrong, so to speak. Um, you can also go into a game with a wrong mindset. There can be other things that factor whether you like the game or not. The gaming group might hate the game, and even if you like it, that can kind of uh, sour your experience for it. You might play a game with someone who's really slow and they drag the game out twice as long as it should be. Some outside event could even affect how much you like the game. It could be really hot in a room. Um, someone could, could, there could be a really loud, annoying TV being watched. You know, Whatever the causes may be. But playing a game the right way, I, there, there, you can get kind of pedantic about that. There are times where I've read reviews of games that I like, and I see the person in an NA trash it, and I'm thinking, you just, you got to play it this way. Because I like the way you're playing it doesn't sound very fun. Like, for example, for me, negotiation games should be wide open, and everyone should be throwing money around and laughing and yelling and trading and, and sitting there and staring each other down. And, but for some people, they play very quietly, and those games are going to play for them very differently. Are they playing the game wrong? No, they're not. They're playing it differently. Now, if a game should be played a specific way, I think that the game mechanism should lead you that way. Those earlier examples where I said people played the game wrong, like someone's playing a war game and they just do something weird, or they're playing a Euro game and instead of trying to get points, they just hog one resource to see if they can shut down the system, those people are deliberately trying to, set the, to mess the game up. They are deliberately going against kind of the spirit of the game. And while the rules allow them to maybe do that, it's, they're not benefiting themselves and they're kind of messing the game up in that regard. But if someone goes into a game and you're like, hey, this game is really not meant to be played on a, you're not supposed to be so aggressive. Like I played games before where you're really aggressive and they're like, well, no, you, you should be so aggressive in the game. Well, I think the rule book, if, you, if, if, if it seems like you should do it one way, the rule book should tell you that's not the best strategy so that people can do it. You say, well, you should learn it after 15 or 20 games. Yeah, but people aren't going to give games that many chances. And so I think a rule book can give hints. I love when rule books give helpful hint sections in them. And they say, here's a good idea. Here's some general strategic uh, uh, tips for beginners. But still, sometimes people aren't going to like it. And you're going to watch them or read their comments online. And you're going to say, they played it wrong. But let them play it wrong. I'm not talking about playing a rules wrong. I'm talking about you're saying they played it in the wrong spirit. You just didn't go into it the right way. You, you went into it looking for a different game than was there. But the game itself should grab you by the throat and say, this, oh, I am great, oh, I am great. It really should. So I'm asking people to give folks a break. Ah, don't give me a break. Jump down my throat. I'm, bring it. Uh, um, but uh, it, I I caught myself doing this many times, looking at a session report and saying, "Wow, that, that's a terrible way to play that game." You know, oh look at that house rule they added. That man, that's so silly. But you know what? If they're having fun with the house rule, let it go. If they didn't like the game and they played by the rules, oh well. They didn't play it right. Let them go play a game that they actually enjoy playing. Because I found that even the person who I disagree with like 100 or 99% of the time, there's still one game that we'll enjoy together, and I look forward to trying that game out with them. Welcome back to the final installment of the Whitleypedia Mega Series on analyzing board game rankings. Today, in our final chapter, we will compare and contrast the top 100 lists of the six Dice Tower contributors so far. 
we will learn many secrets, including the answer to the age-old question, is Z Garcia really the voice of the people? In looking at all six of these lists, there were 405 distinct games. Of those, only 132 were shared by two or more contributors. 26 games were shared by exactly three contributors, and only 10 games were shared by four. Note that of those 10, only one game didn't appear on the People's Choice for sale. Only four games were shared by five contributors. And only one game, only one game appeared on all six lists. That game? Alien Frontiers. Of the six contributors, the two whose lists were most similar were Tom and Sam, who had 38 games in common. And when we compare these lists to the People's Choice, things get even more interesting. 85 of the games on the People's Choice appear on one of these other contributors' lists. So then, of the 15 we selected, but that they didn't, the highest rated at number 26 was Settlers of Catarn. Now, in terms of whose lists most closely matched the People's Choice, number one was Tom Vassal, who had 43 similar games. Sam was close behind him with 42 games. Ryan was next with 30. Eric was next with 28, Dan was 26, and coming in dead last with only 24 mutual games, Z Garcia. Well, it's been a fun ride. Thanks for coming along with us. As we move forward with Whitleypedia, we promise even more interesting fun and adventure than just discussing Board Game Geek rankings in a statistically pedantic fashion until 2015. Aye, aye, aye. What's happening, everybody? I'm John Zengline from ChalkboardGameReviews.com, and my shout-out this time is going to Smashing Plastic. Smashing Plastic is a board game review channel on YouTube run by Sean and Richard, a couple of guys who are living in Australia. And you can tell that these guys are very excited about board games. Their reviews are very dynamic and very entertaining. They make me laugh out loud quite often. Today, we're going to review a board game that makes you make stupid noises with your face. <laughs> They just started a new series on their channel called Smashing Plastic is Excited About Blank, and their first episode was called Dibs. It was a really interesting conversation that made me think about how my game group purchases board games. Generally, I'm the first responder, and I buy a lot of games. And yet, we do have some friends that buy a few here and there, but usually they may be upset because I ran out and bought something right away, and maybe if we had a dib system... Uh, they would have more of a chance to get the games that they want. Now granted, we don't always play together, and so if I buy a copy and someone else buys a copy, I don't mind, because generally I'm going to buy something that I want. But their dibs conversation on Smashing Plastic was really interesting. Do you need to set up a bunch of rules to determine who can buy what games? You might want to give that episode a look. It was pretty cool. I highly recommend Smashing Plastic. They're a very entertaining board game review channel. Throw them a subscription. We'll catch you next time. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen, for this episode. I hope to see many of you at Board Game Geek Con. Please come up and say hi to me there. It is one of the most easygoing conventions. I'll be there from Tuesday to uh, Saturday afternoon. So come by and say hello. Uh, maybe we'll even have a chance to play a game together. Can't promise that, but you never know. It just might happen. I'll have a bunch of little games with me that I'm trying to get played. And, I'll, you know, who knows? But... And we definitely would like to see you at the Dice Tower Show or at Battling Tops. Anyway, guys, this has been a great year. I look forward to ending it now or, you know, going into the end of the year with Christmas time and all. Very excited about that. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.